So I'm going to just pull this so I can read some of the questions and jump in to this modesty discussion. I had no idea this was going to be such a popular topic. I, I mean, meaning when we posted about it, we got about 700 requests <laughs> to join the group. So that's great. Um, and I have three or four questions. So I'm going to just um, hopefully be able through the questions to give you a lot of my thoughts on this topic. Um, this is a question that was posted by a man. He said, uh, growing up in the church, I, uh, I was always really attracted to and appreciative of modesty and really judgmental of immodesty. This persisted until after my wife and I got married. I still remember how on our first date, I made some comment about being really bothered by all the inappropriate women and girls who wore leggings as pants. Several weeks ago, my wife bought leggings she wears as pants and we're both just pleased as punch about it. Now I still think that, that uh, I, I do think that there are women out there who will deliberately sexualize themselves in ways that are undignified and or that are motivated by manipulative or malicious intent. While I do think this is a problem, I think the bigger problem for me personally is that I've spent so much time in my youth and young adulthood being conditioned to objectify women. Yes, okay, and I'll say more about that in a minute. I objectified immodest, which I now don't think means what I thought it meant, women and girls by reducing them all to naive and careless about their bodies and the effect they would have on boys and men, and especially me at best, and deliberately evil seductresses at worst. I also objectified the modest girls by putting them on a pedestal as the idealized form of my someday soon to be fulfilled sexual desires. This is brilliant. I mean, you're really, the questioner is capturing really what that narrative is that so many men and boys ingest. Most of my friends growing up were girls and I feel I spent a lot of time treating them as people and real subjects rather than objects. So this wasn't the way that I viewed the opposite sex, but it was absolutely the dominant lens as far as physical attraction and sexuality were concerned. The real kicker of it is that I felt I was being righteous. I now spend a lot less time being judgmental of how women dress, and I wish more women in our church felt empowered to confidently wear what they feel good and beautiful um, in without having to worry about feeling responsible for potential inappropriate thoughts of men and boys. That said, while the judgment has mostly faded, I still find myself evaluating women as objects by default. I really hate this about myself and I want to change it. I feel like I'm swimming upstream trying to undo years of harmful social conditioning. Do any of you, speaking to the people in the group, have any tips or pointers on how to train myself to have my default setting be seeing women as people or subjects? Okay, good. Um, so let me, so first, um, I just reread an article just kind of in preparation to kind of pull my head back into some of these thoughts uh, that I wrote in Exponent 2 magazine maybe five or six years ago that maybe Ruby can uh, post to the group so that people can access that because I do a more thorough kind of um, dive into some of the themes and especially themes that are in this question. But let me kind of go back and, and speak to some of it. I mean, I think, you know, in our faith we have two realities. Um, we are sexually conservative, and that is to say that we're very careful about, uh, or we have a very narrow um, context in which sex is considered legitimate, and that is committed marital sexuality. And so we have a very high standard of behavior, uh, and particularly pronounced in the fact that the larger culture doesn't share that high standard anymore. Um, and so in a context of sexual liberalism, that our faith holds a much more, much higher expectation around sexuality, there is more sexual anxiety. Now that's not necessarily problematic, it doesn't have to be problematic. People can make conservative choices and not be uh, rejecting of themselves or their sexuality. But usually the way that we handle this issue of our conservative framing is to shame and be afraid of sexuality and sexual feelings and arousal. That's a typical uh, meaning and a typical meaning that gets promoted and handed down. In a, in a faith that has also, at least historically, been predominantly patriarchal, that is to say that men are the ones that have 
but it's been being interpreted more through a male experience and male lens, then if men aren't supposed to have sexual feelings because it will disrupt their relationship to goodness and God, and they see, okay, let me maybe back up just a minute. So in any patriarchal um, society, that is to say that the men are the ones that define the rules. So they have more access to creating the meanings if they are the ones that have more economic control, more, uh, you know, lead institutions more than women, their perspectives are going to predominate in the society and in the mores of the society in the explicit sense. And so if you look at, for example, fundamentalist Islam, which is unabashedly patriarchal, it's similar in the sense that sexuality is forbidden, although it belongs to men and not women. Women should be the kind of pure prizes for the faithful men. You know, a lot of these ideas is if you are as successful as a fundamentalist Muslim that you would have many virgins on the other side. Okay, so that's that's that idea that, that women are the prizes, the virginal women are the prizes for good men. Um, and so what happens in a fundamentalist patriarchal religion is that the women's sexuality is shamed and women should not have sexual desire as a way for the men to feel that they get a woman who is pure and they, get a, uh, they don't have to feel challenged in their masculinity and their sexuality. So in some sects of Islam, and I'm just kind of focusing on Islam right now because it's an explicit version of this, women have clitoridectomies. Okay, so that is that the, they remove women's ability to have pleasure. They cover women up completely as a way of managing men's sexual desire towards them. So women are explicitly the ones who must desexualize themselves and um, do this for the sake of the men. And if the women step out of that, they are punished, devalued, and so on. So, of course, that's in a really egregious form of this, but it's easy even in our society and in our the subcultural elements of our faith to promote many of these ideas unwittingly because... Uh, in my dissertation research, there was um, lots of evidence that even though theologically we hold a single standard around sexual behavior, that both men and women are expected to be chaste until marriage, and there, there's no explicit way in which men and women have a different obligation around chastity and fidelity and so on. But culturally, there were many women, most women that I... Um, interviewed who had internalized these messages in a double standard way. That is to say that they were worse if they had sexual feelings than a boy would be if he had sexual feelings. That because they were the sober drivers, so to speak, around sexuality, that they were responsible for handling how far things would go in their interactions with boys they were dating. That they should cover themselves up because the boys were barely keeping a lid on their sexuality and so the responsibility uh, lay with the women. And so that's a lighter version of this, but that's often in the discourse that girls and boys receive, which is, and, and this is the male version of it that he's saying is problematic, I don't like that I have, I respond this way, but if you see, so on the one hand, I think men in the church are given the idea that masculinity and sexuality are congruent. You know, it's part of being a man. But sexual feelings in the wrong context, um, you know, too much arousal, all that is going to interfere with your goodness and your ability to be in communion with the divine. And so the focus on women managing their sexuality becomes an easy target for a man who's struggling to manage his sexuality because it's it's become the focus. So as this questioner is saying, you know, that he, well, let, let me say it this way. I think if you feel like arousal in you is a problem and it's not um, good to have those feelings or they are at least dangerous um, and you are seeing a beautiful woman and she's creating those feelings in you, 
you know, that's an easy way, place to handle it, is to say she is of the wrong kind of woman because she's creating these feelings in me. And, you know, and I'm going to value the kind of woman who doesn't deal, do anything with her sexuality because that's the kind of woman I want to be with because that will also reinforce me that I have a virginal woman that reinforces my desirability and my sexuality. So, um, okay. So, Clearly, this person is saying that's just another version of objectification. That's another version of reducing women into objects that are there to manage my sexuality. And so that's a problem. And I don't like that I do it. And even if it's that they're so good and so modest, it's still not a good way for me to be in relationship to these women. So um, I agree. On the other hand, another question that I saw a little bit in the Facebook group that people were asking about is like, well, how do you handle feeling attracted to women? And how do you handle the fact that women, whether or not they're trying to be sexy, are? <laughs> and that I notice it, and I may even notice it even if I'm married. Is there a way, this person's asking the question of how do I stop doing this objectification thing? And then there's this other question of, is there a way to notice the sexuality of another person without it being demeaning. So first, I guess what I would say is, what I would first say to the person asking this question is that what he already understands about himself is that he's made the women responsible for something within himself and has been sort of channeled into doing that and he doesn't want to do that. And see, I think that it means that you have to make a distinction between um, you have to get clearer or more at peace with your own sexuality and your own ability to notice sexuality in your environment. And the way I think you get at peace with that is how you're in relationship to your own capacity for arousal, your own acknowledgement of the sexuality that's around you. I mean, I think men are kind of wired to notice feminine beauty much more than the opposite happens in the explicit sense of women towards men, right? Women can objectify men economically and all kinds of... Women can use men as much as men can use women, even if it's not as typically in the frame of sexuality. Um, but uh, how am I in relationship to my sexuality and am I using women to manage that question in me? Right, so if I have feelings I don't feel comfortable having, do I go and blame the woman? If I don't feel like I can even legitimize my sexuality because my wife doesn't want it enough, and then I blame the woman as because she won't legitimize and validate my sexual feelings and desires. So it's an immature and normal thing to kind of look outward to navigate our own way of being in relationship to ourselves, our desires, and to other people. And so I would, if I were this questioner, I think what I would be looking at is, is I, maybe I, you need to make more peace with, meaning when is it that you go into this kind of objectifying and judging position? What's happening that you do it? Is it just that you notice somebody's sexuality? Is it that you um, feel that their sexuality is more explicit than you want it to be? But what is happening inside of you that you're going into a judgmental position? And what do you expect of yourself in that moment? How can you be functioning in a way that you respect, that you would want your daughter's husband to be doing in that certain moment, and that you know you're handling yourself in a responsible way? I think many good men are going to notice feminine beauty. And I think that can be absolutely okay, just depending on how you, what you do about that. If you use it to objectify the other person, if you use it to create anxiety in your spouse, if you use it to go and get their, their validation, even if it's just flirtatious, but you're, you're in a way of using the other person to gratify something in yourself, that's all disrespectful and problematic. And uh, so it's, it's not, I think when people really grow up, they, they tolerate 
that sexual energy is around them, that sexuality is a fundamental part of being human, and they don't begrudge it and fear it so much, which I think we have learned to do, and they act more responsibly in the face of it. They take deeper responsibility for themselves, knowing they can't always control their feelings, but they can control how they respond to their feelings and who they are in the face of those feelings. So I think the way out of this is just taking deeper responsibility for yourself so you aren't trying to manage things, um, uncertainties about yourself and your sexuality through the women you interact with. Now, it is true, as this person says, that some people will use function immodestly. And the true version of this word is that it's out of moderation. So it's modest. A lot of times we put as you are suppressed, you are wearing a you know, paper bag around, whatever, it's not the right word, like in a burlap sack, I think I'm trying to say. You know, you basically are shrouding anything about your sexuality and somehow that's modest. I think it's immodest in the other direction. It's like, I think if you're in moderation, you don't shun your sexuality and you don't uh, flaunt it. You are comfortable with it. You're comfortable with your beauty. You're comfortable with your attractiveness, but you're not working it to get attention and validation from other people. But you can also be at peace with it. Um, you can be noticed or know that someone notices you without going and trying to extract something from them, work a relationship in an inappropriate way. And you can, on the other side of that, notice someone's beauty and be respectful, or you can objectify and leer, right, as another experience. So, you know, I think... Um, it's okay as a woman to feel attractive. A lot of my clients feel that that's somehow stepping over a boundary if they, meaning a lot of my clients struggle between either I'm a respect worthy woman or I'm a sexual woman. That they don't feel that the two can coexist. And we've created that a lot in our culture, which is, you know, it's the Madonna horror split. You're either sexual and devalued or you're non-sexual and valued, but you're not a whole person. And, um, you know, a year ago right now, we were in Turkey, uh, my, my husband and my kids, we were in Turkey, and um, I was dressed modestly by Utah standards, meaning I had a, a skirt on and short sleeve t-shirt, walking around in, you know, pretty warm weather and feeling really uncomfortable because it wasn't just being noticed or something it was being leered at it was that oh she's a certain kind of woman because she's not fully covered up so we have a right to leer at her we have a right to sexualize her and so very quickly I was saying to my husband I don't want to walk anywhere without you because I can feel that devaluing energy it's not a kind of acknowledgement that feels affirming it's a kind of acknowledgement that feels devaluing that's a very important distinction um, also, you know, if somebody is flirting with you, they're tr they want your attention, they want you to give them attention, uh, that's also immoderate in the other direction. It's about trying to get or extract validation um, and that it's, it's off and, um, and it can have a disrespect if, the context, if it's not a dating context or something like that. Um, Okay, I feel like I've talked a lot. Let me just see if there's questions people have here. One second. Let me see. Yes, I think a lot of men struggle with this. Let me just, thanks for the article post. Oh, yes. Have you heard the phrase from missionaries? The harder you work, the hotter the life. Yeah, horrible, horrible. That, that is exactly that idea of God will bless you with an attractive woman who wants to have sex with you and that the men are the main show and the women are the prizes. And it's a, it's a very evil interpretation, actually, of children of God. That, that even, it's an evil idea about God, that God would reward a man with a woman. Okay, it's a very, it's a very objectifying view. Uh, yes, uh, all the time as a missionary, I rolled my eyes at this. Yeah, my ex used to tell everyone that that's why he got me. Oh. Horrible. Okay. No wonder he's an ex. Okay. Went to my husband's mission reunion back when we were engaged, and this was a big thing. They were told to. 
okay, let me see. It wasn't until I went through the temple that I really understood that modesty was part of my relationship with God and no one else. That yes, this really testified to me of the truthfulness of the gospel, but the dangers of the culture that we sometimes have in the church. My parents never made me feel that modesty was for boys to keep their minds clean. Excellent. That's exactly it. But I did get the impression from Sunday school and peers. Yeah, you know, in my dissertation research, the women who actually moved most comfortably toward into sexual um, sexuality and marriage were um, they actually were less likely to have had gone farther than they felt comfortable with when they were dating because their relationship to modesty, their relationship to their sexuality in their families was defined more through their relationship with God and who they wanted to be, not about trying to manage some man. Because when you make in your daughter's mind or in your son's mind even that men are the reference point, it entitles men and it teaches them to objectify women. It also teaches women and girls to reference boys and reference men to say that they are the measures of their value and their sexuality and their worthiness. It's a horrible reference point. It's why I have so many clients, okay? <laughs> because it, it's designed to fail. It, when you actually equip a woman and a girl with the idea that her sexuality is a blessing it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's something designed to give her joy, be a source of joy, and to be a source of being able to love and be loved in her life. And that her beauty is nothing to be ashamed of. And beauty being in the whole of who she is, not in some superficial interpretation, but the essence of who she is and its beauty. And being at peace with that is to be modest, right? People that are modest, let's say that are wealthy, the, the, the modesty is that they can embrace or accept the gift, do good with it, but not go around flaunting their wealth or talking about their wealth or anything like that. That's, that's immodest. So it's being able to receive the gift and be at peace with it and create good through it. And so when you are dressing modestly in the true sense of the word, you're not trying to shroud your sexuality or your desirability or your beauty, but you're not working it either. It's a self respecting decision and respectful of others that would be defined by whatever context you're in. That how you dress at a ward barbecue is going to be different than how you would dress at girls camp. How you would dress going to the beach is going to be different than how you dress in an exam. If the core issue that you're measuring is your relationship, your, is how respectful you're being of yourself and of others. It shouldn't really be defined by lines, I think. I mean, you might take positions in your family that are sort of basic expectations or standards around that, which I think is, is fine. But it, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But the core issue is the issue of self-respect and to not be so afraid of women's sexuality and not be so afraid of female beauty because I think the more that men can be at peace with their sexuality, the more that can ease up in a way that allows for moderation and comfort with oneself. Let me just see what else. Yes, I like the idea that modesty is derived from moderation. Yeah, we're very immoderate about modesty. <laughs> so, yes, modesty equals in moderation. So either extreme is lacking modesty. That's gold. Okay. Uh, let me just see if there's anything else before I go on to the next question. I have three girls, four, six, eight. And I would like to help my girls learn how to develop a healthy sense of self and a positive sexuality. How do I teach them this as we live in a hypersexualized society and culture when it comes to everything like television and music, clothing? For example, my girls enjoy listening to music and they are getting exposed to more music. I see them wanting to learn how to dance to the songs they like, but I'm hesitant to show them certain music videos because of how women dance in a sexual manner. I'm wanting to avoid having them watch these things because I don't want them to learn that they need to be sexy or to be popular or etc. Yeah, it's real tricky. I'm going to see what I can say about that. When I say that we are not watching this certain music video, they would say, oh, because it's inappropriate. Oh, because it's inappropriate. I don't want them to think that being sexy or sexuality is inappropriate, but the objectification of it. But I feel like me limiting certain things or teaching them to be shameful. I'm also not sure what to do when my eight-year-old shows interest in wearing shorts, pants, and bikinis. I, 
I do feel like our society hypersexualizes girls' clothing from sexy Halloween costumes, high heels, etc. I want my girls to be kids and not have to grow up so fast. So how do I balance all of this? Okay, good. And, and that's really in the questions that I'm going to also answer. And, and they're not easy questions, right? Because on the one hand, it's true. Like we've, one of the things I talked about in my research was that we talk to men like they desire and women are to be desirable and the reference of, of sexuality is way too male centric. Okay. But it's also true. I think girls are much more, and I'm speaking as a group and of course there's differences and um, an overlap between groups, but I think that girls are much more wired to care about attractiveness. And I remember, my daughter, I showed her a dress. She was like one and a half years old. I got her a dress that she was going to wear for Christmas. I'm holding her and she's like flapping her arms because she's so excited about that dress, which is completely congruent with who she is now. <laughs> I remember telling my husband how funny it was and he couldn't believe. He's like, no. And I said, no, watch. And I pulled out the dress again and she's so excited. My boys still don't care. I'm like, really? Sweats? Do you want to put on like a shirt and clothes? But no. So I, I think there's... And I think, you know, my caring about my appearance is not about, oh, I just need men to think I'm attractive. It's about being true to something in me. So I think there's this balance between when is it about being who you are and embracing who you are and doing that in a way that's self-respecting, not trying to extract validation or control or devalue yourself through it. Because what, what I worry about is when we overdo this okay and we make boys the reference point then that's a very dangerous idea even if it's about being modest and boys are the dangerous uh, sorry being super modest and boys are the reference point or being immodest use that language and boys are the reference point that's the dangerous issue self-respect is the guiding principle so let me let me um and just to kind of this video thing in the dancing i mean i'm going to say to you i don't really know i mean it depends a little bit because on the one hand, I think it's okay, and I'm not saying for an eight, six, and four-year-old necessarily. Uh, first of all, I think the more neutral you are about some of these things, the more kids don't get super focused on them. Um, if you're just kind of more matter of fact about it, and if it just feels off because the dances are too sexual for your kids, I would just say, yeah, it's just, it's kind of dancing that it's not fun for kids. So it's a little just more neutral, uh, maybe not even so sh loaded with the ideas of inappropriate. Um, because sexual dancing in the right context could be a wonderful thing, right? So um, hang on, I've, I've got about 70 thoughts in my head, so let me just think. You know, I was thinking about, like, we don't, aren't really a sports-oriented family. And so if we were watching, but if we were to have watched the Super Bowl, I, I think we would just turn off the halftime show. Not because I'm thinking, oh, these women are absolutely subjugating themselves. And that's not entirely clear to me. But because I don't really want to participate in an erotic dance with my children around <laughs> okay, okay and I'm not sure that I would even want to participate in the kind of eroticism that they are expressing in that dance that I don't find very appealing really and I, the, the the overtness of it and the kind of public nature of it and the way it fits with this sort of hyper masculine picture so I think we would just turn it off in a matter of fact way and I think my kids would all just agree with it like nobody wants to participate in that because it's over the top. Um, but it wouldn't be like, oh my gosh, you guys can't know that this exists out there. I, I wouldn't, I just wouldn't feel that way. I would be completely fine if I knew that my sons had watched that because they heard people talking about it. Um, and maybe it's because of who my sons are. They aren't, they're, they're just, they're just seem pretty chill about sexuality in a lot of ways. So, um, Okay, I feel like I lost my thought though. So, so I don't know entirely the answer, but I think it, it, it's not that sexuality is problematic, but is it appropriate and is it a form or a version or an expression of sexuality that you think it will help your children and yourself or not? Okay, let me go back to um, this other question. So another person writes, I've come 
and this is kind of similar to some of the questions that were just being posted. I've come around to a much healthier place, place with modesty, but having grown up strictly following the standards of the church with confusing messages from my parents, I'm stumbling a little with my own daughter. She's seven and is very perceptive about what others think. I've tried to be very neutral about clothing in our few conversations about it. I recently bought her a tankini swimming, swimsuit and waited to see her response. I expected a little hesitation because she's often commented on and had questions about people showing their skin. She said she liked it but that she would pull it up so that her stomach showed because that's what her best friend's swimsuit looks like. I'm not comfortable with her at this young age showing too much skin, but because she's felt some of my anxiety, maybe I shouldn't worry about it. And then this person goes on to, she says, so how do I set boundaries about modesty without shaming her friend or creating anxiety about her body? Um, I have yet to take the kids course, she says, and I do talk about this in the kids course, but then she also adds this a little bit more. She says, I'm fully on board with everything related to positive body image, love, beauty redefined, Julie Hanks. Prof professionally, I work with women who typically have poor body image related to chronic dieting and help them heal those broken relationships. I own bikinis and other two-piece style suits. So I guess what I'm asking is how do you navigate conversations with young girls to help them respect their bodies in regard to their clothing without guilting or shaming? especially when you were raised to strictly follow church's rules of modesty. I don't want to throw out the idea of modesty altogether because I believe there are some good values in it, which our church culture has often twisted. Okay, so, I mean, I think there's maybe two, two ideas. And, and again, I don't know all the answers to this because who your child is and how she's relating to the question. I mean, I think if, if my daughter were saying at age seven, I just want to do it because my friend's swimming suit is like that. I would probably just be like, okay, she she wants to do what her friend is doing. That's the primary driver, and it's not a big deal. She's only seven years old. She has no concept of sexuality at this point, not in any any form that is getting translated into her swimwear. And um, so, on the one hand, I think that's a perfectly legitimate response, and just see it for what it is. Is is she wants to be more like her friend. Um, if I felt like the friend was focused on some idea around sexiness and or that my daughter was somehow wanting to imitate this idea and feeling that it mattered that she present herself in that way, I think I would be kind of tracking that and starting to think about that a little bit to see if she's feeling that she must present herself as attractive as, um, you know, that she kind of is understanding there's a certain kind of power in this, but that it's a reductionistic power. Because I'd want to just start talking to her about it a bit. I'd want to start, you know, seeing if that's getting played out in her life and in her development, and not necessarily come down hard on the issue of the swimming suit. I don't know that I would really worry about that. She's young. She's not a teenager trying to, you know, get guy's attention or something like that. It's a little different conversation. Um, the, the, the third idea I have about it is it's okay to, to just have a kind of matter of a fact family standard and say, you know, in our family we don't do that. It's just, you know, your friend is fine and her family probably has a different standard, but we just don't do bikinis in our family. This person couldn't say that because she has bikinis, but but, you know, if you had some idea that, like, this is just a kind of basic understanding about how we dress and we're just doing it that way and there's nothing wrong with bikinis, but we prefer a more modest, you know, a little more conservative approach to it, I think you can be matter-of-fact about that, hold a position within the family that's not about high control or high anxiety. Um, and... I, again, I don't think sexual conservatism is a problem. It's a problem when you put the onus of that on girls and say they have to constrain their sexuality and their desirability to manage this, this cultural desire or wish. So, you know, you can, I mean, honestly, I think I'm on the modest side. I, there's, there's LDS friends of mine who are much more just, for me, it's more like an issue of privacy. I just want the privacy of 
uh, my body having privacy that is just for me and my relationship with my spouse. So, it, but it's not about body shame. And sometimes people think, oh, to prove that you don't have body shame, you have to be willing to kind of show your body. And I just think that's simply not true. And and it's really what feels self-respecting to you. So you want to be looking for if your daughter feels she has to manage how she appears to get validation, either that she's a good girl, the right kind of girl, or that she's an attractive girl. That's the, 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 the link I would want to rupture. Um, let me just take up one more question and then I'll see what other people have asked. Um, Somebody says, I'm curious what others think about women wearing bikinis. Is that modest or is it just being content and confident in what you're wearing? I was at a swimming pool with a friend and that person commented that this, that a, another woman wearing a bikini should not be wearing that bikini given how large she is. I know this person doesn't think women should be wearing bikinis at all. I said to my friend something like, I wish I could feel that confident to wear a bikini. Yeah. Totally. I told the person that size doesn't bother me. I just want women to be happy with themselves. Absolutely. I grew up being not happy with my body image. I was shamed for wearing a bikini and that was just for tanning in my own yard. I was told that the young women would have to wear t-shirts to a boating party with young men and young women and I tried to speak up on how impossible it was to ski in a t-shirt, yes, and that the boys should wear one too but was shamed by my comment. I just realized I have a few separate topics I'm addressing, but thank you. Okay. Yeah, so again, it's tricky because the context matters, uh, whether or not something is modest or not. It would clearly be immodest to wear a bikini to an exam, okay, because it's just so incongruent with what's happening in that setting. And the other thing is what is defined as modest is, is a shifting context because now in um, you know post-sexual revolution society bikinis are pretty standard wear okay and so it has a different meaning than if you were in 1912 showing up at the beach in a bikini okay clearly or if you were in Turkey in a bikini um, so I think what you need to think about is, is it about what I'm most comfortable in? Is it about what, you know, you know, I feel attractive and, and like being in it, but I'm not trying to get attention or sort of, you know, in a disrespectful position to myself and others, and I feel comfortable? I think that's more important than the specifics, the specific lines. And if you're being responsible with your sexuality and how you're in relationship to others, you can expect others to do the same, that they will handle their thoughts, their feelings, and so on. Um, again, so it's very hard to say like a bikini is any specific thing at any time, depending on what it means, what you're doing within that, and what you're creating through it. Um, I think I have one more thought and I just forgot. Let's see. Okay. Um, oh yeah, just, just going to this idea of the skiing with a shirt on, that kind of stuff, it, it kind of speaks to how we're willing to actually jeopardize women's well-being to manage this issue of women's sexuality. And, you know, I think in the church, men have tremendous anxiety about women's sexuality. They really do. <laughs> I mean, pornography and... And the fact that, you know, you're not supposed to have these feelings, they take you further from God. And so I can see why there'd be lots of contempt and control around women's sexuality because it's sort of like bringing up the wrong, quote unquote, wrong feelings in them rather than a more grown up position around this, which is that I, women are sexual beings and I may notice them and find them attractive and I yet still have a responsibility to to handle that part of my masculinity, that part of being a man, and to be respectful, okay? And not basically ask women to cover themselves up because I can't get a hold of my sexuality because I don't want to grow into a more mature relationship with my sexuality. Okay, let me just see what other people are saying here. Yeah, men being the reference point, okay. Let me just see. 
you see this, oh, so many. I'm going to see if there's one that... Somebody says, I've been told so often that I am sexy, so men can't help themselves. What do I expect? I owed it to them to, oh yeah, horrible, to fulfill something for just being alive and pretty. Yeah, exactly. That's sad. Um, how do garments and covering our nakedness help or hinder our healthy understandings of modesty? So, so first of all, I would say just from a kind of historical perspective, modesty or clothing, I should say, is designed in part for warmth and, and all that, but it's also designed to regulate sexuality. And not necessarily in the direction that a lot of us think. It is partly about making a distinction between private and public. Um, and, and so that's important because it does give a message about how much sexuality you want to share with the people that are around you. Um, but also, paradoxically, it creates more eroticism for there to be more that's private. And, um, and so, that the idea that I, you know, like we have made shoulders sexy in LDS culture. <laughs> we, when we hypersexualize and want to cover, it becomes paradoxically much more the focus. So we, we unwittingly eroticize women a lot by being so anxious about the sexuality of their bodies. And so, but the, the good version of that is that being modest in the larger sense, but then showing more privately, it creates more meaning. I had a client who was uh, in the Middle East doing some work there and had a colleague who was Muslim, always had her hair covered in their work together and their relationship was getting closer and closer and then at a certain point, she took her head covering off. Now, this is a Western guy who had seen lots and lots of hair and never ever had eroticized it. But because of that meaning context, that this was, he, she was letting him in, letting him know her in a different way. And it was very, very arousing and very high meaning, right? And so, you know, the, there is something beautiful about a kind of protection of modesty that it, functions as a way of making a distinction between you are someone special to me that I want to uh, be in a particular kind of relationship with. And I think we lose some of that when we are too sexually liberal. That said, I still want to go around telling people they must be modest because then you're still regulating other people to manage yourself as opposed to equipping women, for, for example, with the ability to think about what is self-respecting for me. How do I want to be in relationship to my body and my sexuality in a way that I'm at peace with, that I'm comfortable with who I am? And I would, you know, be like, you know, just less a popular culture you get, the better, because it's so much of that messaging around females must be sexy to have value. And give your girls as lots of ways to demonstrate their value and their capacity to themselves. And beauty can certainly be a part of it, but don't let it be immodest in that it's the, the, a primary or dominant focus of, of their sense of self. That it's just, you know, frosting on the cake of, of who they are and how they're developing. Um, this person says, I can't tell you how many times I've heard stake leaders say over the pulpit that girls need to be modest so that they don't become pornography for the boys. It makes me so uncomfortable. Yeah, it's horrible. A horrible idea because again the onus is on the female not the male right if it's about self-respect don't reduce yourself to a sexual object totally fine if you think someone's doing that either in her efforts to shroud her sexuality or to flaunt it certainly you can talk to girls about the self disrespect that's emblematic of that focus but talk to boys about the fact that their sexual feelings are normal and yet being respectful and making wise choices is fundamentally their responsibility and it's a measure of their ability to inhabit their masculinity. And to be good men and to be strong men is to handle this great thing of sexuality in a way that creates goodness and respect in you and in others. That's, that's the focus. Um, 
it's helpful for me to look at other cultures and not have such a Western conservative view of piercings and tattoos. They have a rich cultural and ancestral value. I think we can miss that when we compare getting a tattoo to defacing a temple. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Some cultures that, you know, the higher the status, the more your whole body is tattooed. Uh, can I write a book on this topic? It's nice of you. Probably will. I've got other books <laughs> I'm supposed to get to. I will eventually, but okay. Um, let me see anything else here. I think I heard from a youth conference when I was young that modesty of the young women would determine the worthiness of the men. Yeah, terrible. Okay. How do garments play a role in this? I've always found it weird how much we look to see who is wearing garments or isn't, right? That's definitely this fantasy idea that we have that this is a private thing when culturally it's, it's not. Uh, and how we make that feel like such a worthiness thing for all of us, including having to speak with leaders about if we are wearing it. Yes, and my, my wish would be that it was a much more personally symbolic and personal decision because the temple and those covenants are personal. And that the, if the garment is designed as a reminder of those promises, I, I, I think that's a beautiful thing. And if we if, if relate to it as a way of keeping ourselves, re, reminding ourselves of our own promises to our integrity and to who we want to be, wonderful. But I think that what this person is speaking to, and I, I think is true, is that it can often be a social control mechanism and a way of taking the reference from the internal focus, with, which Christ spoke about so much, to this external focus of whether or not it's the Sadducees, Pharisees idea of like we're demonstrating to one another what kind of goodness we are as opposed to how can I really live a life that's moral and ethical and good and how do I relate to my own commitments to my integrity and to, the, and to God. Um, okay. All right. Let me just see. I think I need to stop in just a second. Let me just see if there's anyone. A six-year-old started buying clothes online with money she's earned at her job during the quarantine time. They're not modest, and it makes her dad and me very uncomfortable when she wears them. How can we support her in a healthy way to wear clothes that are more honoring of her? Okay. I don't, I haven't yet had that experience because my daughter is 14 and pretty just modest instinctively. Um, and I, but I do know that controlling teenagers is not an easy thing. <laughs> and, uh, and how, how to relate to that. I think what I would probably be talking to her about is, well, if you think your daughter is working it in a way and she's trying, and this is a very typical thing to do at this age because teenagers are insecure and they're trying to define a sense of self and they're trying to kind of demonstrate to their peers that they're worthy and they're good and she might be able to get that kind of attention. I mean, I had the blessing of not being able to get that kind of attention when I was a teenager, so that was a good thing. But, you know, it, she's maybe able to get that kind of attention. And I would be talking to her about the fact that you are uncomfortable with it, that you don't, uh, because you think it is over-sexualizing her, and that it does, it does send a message, and it doesn't mean she's responsible for what boys may do. Boys are always responsible for what they do. But she wants to think about if that's the message she wants to send about herself, if you really think she's devaluing herself through this and sexualizing herself. So I would just be explicit in a conversation with her about what your concern is, about what you see her doing, and that while she could clearly enjoy the attention that that gets her or the validation that it gets her, that if she's making male validation her focus, that it's a dangerous precedent. It's not a good way to relate to herself, even though she can easily get it. It's not a sustainable way. So, I mean, you have to kind of figure out as a family how much you're just going to say, sorry, in our household, you can't do that. Okay, you could take those positions. It gets a little trickier as your teenagers are getting older and figuring out how much license to give them to make their own choices versus where you really hold a line. Um, but, uh, but, but yes, I think it's about helping her think about what the meanings are at a minimum that she's creating through her choices. Um, 
Let's see. Candy says, modesty is an inside job in my experience. What we wear is less important than how we wear it. I agree with that and what it means and what we're creating. Um, okay, good. Let me just see if there's any last thing I want to... Uh, all right. A lot of these questions reveal the reality that many women are at war with their bodies and want to give their daughters better guidance than they receive. Absolutely. Absolutely. The kind of, you know, I'll say this one last thing. Like a few years ago, there was an uh, article in The Friend um, about a seven year old, I think, who was wanting to buy a tank top because her friend had a tank top. And then she, the spirit prompted her to not buy it. And so she didn't buy it. And so, of course, that's just a story, but it's a story for young children. And I think it's a dangerous story because. Here we're trying to not objectify, supposedly, and not sexualize our girls, and yet it's bringing sexual self-consciousness to a seven-year-old. That's the danger of getting hyper-fixated about this, that you're basically saying you need to be vigilant about the vigilance or about the gaze of men. And teaching girls at a young age to manage that gaze and to be responsible to that gaze is a very disempowering position. And yet, most of us have grown up with that as the reference point, right? Like a lot of the, girl, the women I interviewed were saying that they were always navigating, I want to be seen as sexy, but not too sexy. There was a terrible talk out there that I remember reading a few years ago that somebody was, some state leader was giving a talk where he was saying, you know, you want your skirt to be, I can't remember, short enough to be interesting, but long enough to, I don't care. It was terrible, but basically it's all about you, you've got to like walk this impossible line where you're both sexy but pure and desirable but not too desirable. And it, it just like the impossibility of it. And the, the problem is you're trying to manage men's minds through your choices, which is what women end up often doing in sex and in their sexual relationship and all those things rather than managing their own mind and their own choices and the and the decency of those choices, and embracing their God-given body and sexuality, and being okay with their desirability, being okay with their sexiness, being okay with uh, doing what makes them comfortable, and let men handle themselves, right? And of course, that's different than working it to basically uh, inflict suffering in men. Okay, that would be a little different, but most, uh, you know, but but that's. But if you're in a respectful position to yourself and others, you don't have anything to worry about from a moral perspective. Okay, thank you everybody. I hope this had some clarifying elements in it and there's so many comments there so we can maybe take up more of the discussion in the group as well. So, And I, Ruby will post some of the podcasts I've done on the topic and also um, on the article that I wrote a few years ago. Okay, happy Friday everybody. Bye.